Right, we're in John chapter 19. Um, but I actually want to start in John chapter 13. If you go with me to John chapter 13 and remind you, yes, we will finish John. We're not, we're not going back to the first chapter. Uh, although that would be interesting and exciting. Uh, chapter 13. Um, The Spirit of God uh, tells us through, the, through John the writer, um, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Or some translations would say, love them uh, to the uttermost. We have uh, the last couple of uh, sessions been walking on holy ground. We, we, have, we have been through the um, unjust trial and then the crucifixion uh, of our Lord. Yeah, it is in that crucifixion that Jesus ultimately fulfills that scripture. He is loving them to the uttermost, and he's loving them to the end, to the end of his life on this earth. And his love is manifest by his sacrificial death. There is no greater love than one would give up his life for another. If that's the case, then what Jesus is doing is immeasurable in terms of its value. For he's, he's giving up his life uh, not for our human life, but for our eternal life. And in order to do that, he, is, <clears throat> he has been and is willing to take the wrath of the Father against your sin and my sin and to pay for it. To do that, he has to suffer <clears throat> and he has to die. But it shouldn't surprise us because God is love and Jesus is a second member of the Trinity, so he manifests that love uh, in all of his being. In every place we see him, we see manifestations of his love. It is just that the crucifixion is the ultimate manifestation of it. But there are others there are um, other personal ways that Jesus does that. He's done that for the disciples all during the time he's been with them, as he's walked with them, cared for them, uh, taught them, encouraged them, prepared them. And they've seen him. They've seen his love and compassion uh, toward others, toward those that are in need, as he healed people and even raised them from the dead. And, and again, one of the ultimate compassions and acts of love was his forgiving of sins. As we come to this section of scripture, we move from this uh, profoundness in terms of the crucifixion and his payment for our sin to the very personal act of love that he does while he's still on the cross, while he's still suffering. While he's still suffering, he's thinking of He's thinking of others. And so with that, let's go to uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And verse uh, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There's this group of women. They are with the Lord a lot, and they'll be with him during this time, and then we'll see them again at the time of the resurrection. The the group consists of his mother, who is there at the foot of the cross witnessing what was promised, what was prophesied to her at the beginning. Go with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 35. In Luke uh, chapter 2 verse 35, remember this prophecy? Then uh, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There is a promise that she is going to suffer an agony beyond agonies as she will watch her son 
be pierced and die, because that's his destiny. That is why he came. So Mary is there. She is faithful to the end. Mary is a godly woman. We've talked about that before. She is a specially blessed woman. She is not, um, she is not in a sense, the mother of God. She's not to be exalted. She's not co-redemptrix with Christ. She uh, was not... Um, immaculately conceived. She did not did not ascend into heaven. Uh, she is a wonderful, godly woman, faithful uh, to the end to be with her son. She loves him dearly, but she needed a savior, and she had one in the Lord. And Salome was her sister. Interesting. Salome was the mother of James and John, and the sons of thunder which really makes them cousins of the Lord in a human sense. The third woman was Mary, was, uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was the mother of James the Left, the other apostle named James. And the final was Mary Magdalene, who Scripture said had seven demons cast out uh, from her. They're there at the foot of the cross together with John. All the other men have left. They've uh, headed for the hills, so to speak. But the women are and have been and will continue to be faithful. Note that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any way we can erase things from this recording? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've lost my place. No. <laughs> Okay, so the women are at the foot of the cross. Uh, Jesus is uh, nearing the end of his agony and his time on the cross as death uh, quickly approaches. And yet he still, in the midst of that suffering, uh, does this. And it is quite amazing when you think about it. In verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Isn't that magnificent? It's such a very practical thing, such a very uh, personal thing. It is a tender at, the, at, the, at, its, uh, at, its, at its core. It is that his mother needs protection and needs provision. It speaks to the fact that a Joseph has been dead for some time. There isn't any question about that. He has just not been in Scripture from very early on in the Lord's life. He has passed, and the children from their marriage are not believers. So Jesus knows that she needs, particularly in that society, but at any time, she needs to be cared for and watched over. And so he commits his mother to John, the one whom Jesus loved. That's the way John always identifies himself. He never uses his own name in his writings, but that's who he's talking about. So he creates this very special and very unique relationship while he hangs on that cross, suffering and dying for us. He extends that compassion to his mother and to John because John then has another woman to care for him and watch over him. They'll need each other in the days and months ahead. It, it, it will be a difficult time, but Christ cares about them both in a very, a very tender and very special personal way. And, you know, you, you look at the love uh, that Christ has for us, and you look at the cross, and you look at these what you might call small acts of love that he that he extends toward us. And I couldn't help but think about the reality of it. You know, um, sometimes we get caught up in the troubles of this world. Sometimes we uh, get a little discouraged. And sometimes even that discouragement leads us to question the Lord or maybe even doubt his love. Um, and I would, I would I would commit to you this section of Scripture. We could go a lot of places in the Word of God, but I would commit this section to you. The cross. The cross. Because it's at the cross that you have to know that God loves you. There can be no higher expression of his love 
than what Jesus is doing on that cross in these sections of Scripture. And he, he loves you to the uttermost. So never measure God's love by your comfort. <laughs> never measure God's love by your circumstances. Never doubt his love. Simply look for what he desires you to see in him through those circumstances. What is it that he is doing in and through those circumstances for you? Never doubt that he's doing them for any other reason than he loves you. He can't love you anymore. But he doesn't promise it, us in that love perfect circumstances. He just doesn't. He just promises that his love will move us through those circumstances and change us in those circumstances and ultimately bless us. Jesus loves us enough to go to the cross. Jesus loves us enough to care for our personal needs, just like he cared for his mother and for John. And this isn't the only place that he's expressed that. You can find that throughout the gospel in its testimony of the love of Christ. In verse 28, then, as we come back to the text, he says, after this, Jesus, knowing all things, don't, don't pass by that, don't, don't skip by that, knowing all things is what? It, it's, it's John's, uh, once again, confirmation that Jesus is, in fact, God. He is every bit man, but every bit deity, because he is omniscient. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what the plan of the Father is in the minutest of detail. And that's what he's saying. I know the plan in the minutest of detail and what? Knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. I know it's done. I came to do the will of the Father, and I have done it. I have done it. And then he says, I thirst, and now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with the sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. You see, it was done, but there was one last prophecy to be fulfilled. One last prophecy to be fulfilled. While on the cross, we're going to have more prophecies fulfilled after, but the last one on the cross is Psalm 69:21, where it says that he will be offered up this sour wine to drink. You see, once again, John wants us to understand that this event is in the full and utter control of a sovereign God. And he fulfills every detail of that plan. This, by the way, is not the gall that was offered to him at the earliest part of the crucifixion before he was actually crucified. This is a different liquid. That was a form of sedative that they used to try to control people that they thought would fight and struggle against the crucifixion. But this, in fact, is that sour wine, that vinegar prophesied in Psalm 69. And then after that, verse 30, he said, it is finished. Now, this is a cry. This is a yell. This is a declaration of victory. It is finished. I, I couldn't help but think about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Go with me for a minute to Hebrews 12, 2. Remember this powerful verse. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He has endured it, despite the shame, despite the mocking, despite the ridicule, despite the pain, despite the wrath of God placed on him for all the sins of mankind. He has endured it. And now he cries, it is finished. You have to know there was joy in that cry. 
There was joy in that cry. It is that joy of the completed work, the consummated plan, the finished atonement, the appeased wrath, the fulfilled prophecies, and the fact that heaven is now open to repentant sinners who come by faith to Jesus Christ. Heaven is open. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And then it says, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Once again, the specificity of John's report, the accuracy of his words, they are exceedingly important because we have been told over and over and over again that no one takes the life of Christ. He gives it up willingly. That's what he said in chapter 10, verse 18, early on in his ministry. And that's what's been evidenced all through the sovereign control of God at every point in his life, in his betrayal, in his trial, and in his execution. Men and their evil have plotted and succeeded, but never outside of the sovereign control of our God. He willingly gives up his spirit. And then John, once again, it happens several times in his account. He moves from the magnificence of Christ and the love of Christ and the tenderness toward the women and the completion of the task to the evil of men. Just in one verse. We just move from glory to depravity. In verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. That was, it was the Sabbath of the Passover, which made it a special Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Probably a reference to Deuteronomy 21, a, a desire on the, on the Jewish leader's part to not quote-unquote, ceremonially defile the land by having a dead body exposed and hanging uh, on a tree before sunset. Now, don't ask me to explain that. I don't, I don't understand the details of that. But it is, in fact, uh, an allusion to that. And so they are concerned, once again, about their ceremonial laws, about the, the things that are of lesser importance. I mean... I mean, how hypocritical can you get if you're concerned about the ceremonial defile of the land by a dead body that isn't buried? Well, you kill the creator of the universe. I, I don't want to defile the land, but I'll kill the creator. I'll, I'll, kill, I'll kill the king of kings. I'll kill the son of God. I'll kill the Messiah. Boy, what a... Amazing evil that is. And yet, in a very real sense, everyone that doesn't come to Christ finds themselves in exactly the same place. Whether you're religious or whether you're atheistic, it really makes no difference. In your denial of Jesus Christ, you deny the cross, you count it of no importance, and you count on your false religion, ceremonial activity, human goodness, all the trivial things that you think will bring you rightly into the presence of a holy God? Well, they wanted the body off the cross. They needed action. They needed 
the death process to be sped up because the, the death on the cross was an extended death. It was a horrible, torturous, agonizing death, and it extended over days, sometimes two, three, even four days. Jesus is on the cross for six hours. That is impossible. <laughs> that is impossible. So to get him off that cross dead, they have to speed the process. So they go to Herod. They request permission to have the soldiers break the shin bones, as we said last time. That speeds the death because the only way to breathe while you're on the cross is to push yourself up against the nails in your feet or ankles in order to fill your lungs when you can no longer push because you no longer have functioning bones, you will ex be asphyxiated quickly. So the soldiers came, verse 30, 32, broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with them. They were in exactly the place that the soldiers expected them to be. They were alive. They needed their legs broken. They broke them. But when they came to Jesus, when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs, verse 33. And it surprised them. I mean, it shocked them. Um, so they had to make sure. So they took a spear, and they just drove it into his side. Don't, don't ever forget, these guys were pros. They'd killed thousands of people by crucifixion. They, they, they understood how it worked, and they made no mistakes. The guy was supposed to be dead, and we'll make sure. So he seems like he's dead. We don't need to break his legs, but just to make sure, We'll drive that spear into his side. This was such an unusual event that John determines that he is going to add this personal testimony in the midst of this description of the event. He says, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that he may believe. I just love those things. I, I love those comments. He's going to make another one at the end of this book. I mean, John's sitting there a couple thousand years ago. He's just he's sitting up here, and he's just saying, come on, guys, look. I know this doesn't sound, I know this is difficult to believe. Uh, generally speaking, they all die two or three days from now. No one dies in six hours. But I'm telling you, he gave up his spirit. He died. He made the choice. He willingly did it. I was an eyewitness to it. And I'm telling you that the soldiers proved it. They didn't break his legs, and they put that spear into his side. And I'm telling you all of this. I'm telling every one of you, and I'm telling everyone that reads this book, I'm telling you so that you may believe. Believe what? Not just that he was dead, but believe that he was the Son of God, that he has fulfilled every prophecy that spoke of this event, and that no one takes his life because he is the author and the finisher of life. It has happened just as the Scripture foretold. And so he goes on. He says, look, for these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. The Passover lamb in Numbers 9.12. Well, let's go there. Go to Numbers, Numbers 9.12. Talking about that sacrifice, and verse 12, this is, They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinance of the Passover, they shall keep. And then in Psalm 34, Psalm 34, verse 20.
He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Not one of them is broken. The Passover lamb had to be spotless, without blemish, with no bones, bones broken. It had to be perfect. That was the picture. Every time they sacrificed that lamb, it had to be the perfect one, the best one, because it was a picture of the ultimate Passover lamb. So when Jesus comes as God's Passover lamb, he cannot be less than perfect. That includes he, he cannot be with sin, and he cannot violate any of the prophecies about him. And since he's that lamb, he cannot have any bones broken. I would say, too, when you celebrate communion, I think that uh, that we we speak of this is my body when we take the host, and some translations say broken, but I think it's a wrong translation. It really it should be given because it was not broken for us; it was unbroken. So John is saying uh, this is no myth. This is no story made up by the early church. I am an eyewitness testimony to this event. It happened in all of the detail that prophecy dictated. Evil men had succeeded in killing him, but at every point they had done exactly what God had determined would be done. He had been lifted up. He had died crucified. They had cast lots for his clothing. He had been given sour wine. His legs had not been broken. He had been pierced so that they would look on him both now and I think in the future, Zechariah 12.10. And these are only a few that John picked out at this time during the crucifixion event. It doesn't mean there weren't hundreds more because there were. It was prophesied when he would come. It was prophesied how he would live. It was prophesied how he would minister. It was prophesied the miracles he would do. It was prophesied the words he would speak. It was prophesied the person and the method of his betrayal. It was prophesied the details of his trial. It was prophesied the details of his death. It's going to be prophesied and has been prophesied of his resurrection, his ascension, his return, and his reign. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy not for idle speculation, for proof. For proof. So that you can believe. So that you can follow out of a heart that trusts him. That trusts him. You come to Christ, you don't take a blind leap in the dark, as some theologians have said. You come with your mind engaged, your eyes opened by the Spirit of God, understanding for the first time truth. And the ultimate truth you must understand is the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you grow and as you learn, you get the privilege of understanding that truth in the most minute details of the Scripture because He wants you to continue to grow in your belief. It's history. It's history. And if you've already come and you're growing, John wants you to understand that that's what gives you your confidence. That and the indwelling Spirit of God. Go with me to First John. We were in that today in the service. In First John... First yeah. John uh, 5.13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So, he wants you to believe if you haven't believed. If you're sitting here today, you've never come to Christ, he wants you to know that it's true. 
It can't be anything else. This stuff can't happen by chance. There's no random chance it could bring all of these events to their perfect culmination. It happens because God has ordained it. And if you are here and have already come to that place, then what he wants you to know is it's true. It's true. And so it should impact your life. It should impact how you think, the decisions you make, the places you go, the words you say. If you really believe it, he says, you will keep my commandments. You'll follow me. You'll love me. You'll allow my spirit to transform you. Be confident. Be confident. It's true. <laughs> Be confident. He loves you. And he'll love you to the uttermost and to the end. Jesus cries out, it is finished. He is victorious. He is no victim. And the ultimate proof? It's coming. Remember that sermon? It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And when Sunday comes, there will be no doubt. It is fascinating to me that um, skeptics try all kinds of reasons, find, try to find all kinds of reasons to deny the cross. One of many of those denials is um, that he never died. And I, you may have heard that. That he just uh, swooned. He, he passed out. And somehow they got him off that cross alive, and he revived. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Please, there's a lot of problems. But, but what I want to show you is this. Go with me to Mark, chapter 15. And verse um, 44. Um, 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about Joseph next week. He's a fascinating man, more fascinating, I think, than you realize. And, uh, and he plays uh, eminently in this, um, in this continually unfolding uh, truth about Christ, from his trial to his death to his burial uh, to his resurrection. Joseph is a critical man, and we'll, we'll talk about that next time. But he goes to Pilate because he wants uh, the body. He wants to bury Jesus. But in 44, Pilate marveled that he was already dead. You see, Pilate understood crucifixion, and he understands that he should not have been dead. And he, so he summons the centurion, and he asks him if he had been dead for some time, and he, when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Don't you see what God did? The evil of those men, having the legs broken to speed the death, forced that discussion. Joseph of Arimathea goes for the body because he understands that he's dead. He's dead only because of the work of the centurions. And so the centurions, who have no skin in the game, are questioned by Pilate. Two parties that either have no concern about Jesus or hate him. And they give testimony. Pilate asks, is he dead? The centurion answers, he's dead. Give him the body. The... the, the the Roman soldier in control of his death, the professional soldier assigned to killing him, renders the testimony with no reason to lie, no reason, no motive to say anything other than the truth. He renders the testimony, he is dead. End of story. 
and the skeptic. Jesus died on that cross. And now, and now, he has to get into the grave. He has to get into the grave because the scripture has said he's going to be in the grave for three days and then come out. He has to get in by sundown. He has to get in by sundown. But there's nobody around. All the disciples have gone. The women can't do it. They can't get that body off the cross. How does he get off the cross into the grave in the right timing? And how does he get into the right grave? That's for next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you uh, for this blessed uh, portion of Scripture because it's all about your blessed Son and our blessed Savior. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. We truly are uh, on holy ground, and we are in awe of you and all that you've done. Especially, Lord, we're just, uh, we just revel in the fact that you would love the Father enough and love us enough to do this thing. So we, uh, we thank you for it. We are humbled by it, and we desire to respond to it with lives that love others and love you and follow you with a whole heart. Lord, use our lives as you see fit until you return. In Jesus' name, amen.